Pittsburgh, co-authored by Fancy Goodwin, Marceline, and Kazi, entitled Excuse me, Synthesis of MTB New Jersey Zero Hydrogenation and uh, George Marston presenting it. You left the slide behind. Jim Goodwin, and Rashid Kazi. Let me start out by talking a little bit about MTBE. Uh, I think most of us know the, the importance of MTBE in, our, uh, in the current uh, uh, political and environmental uh, state of the, of the world. And of course, it's, uh, it's one of the fastest growing chemicals uh, in, in terms of production nowadays because of its ability to be used as a non-polluting octane enhancer, uh, and having high PTU content, and all kinds of other good things about it. Uh, it's commercially made, the, the commercial process is actually very simple. You take methanol, you take isobutylene, and you react it in, at slightly elevated pressures in a liquid phase uh, using a sulfonic acid resin. And I have exchanged sulfonic acid resin as a catalyst, uh, mainly amberless 15. Uh, it'd be nice if we were able to make this kind of uh, product from synthesis gas as we, uh, as we study ways of producing fuel from synthesis gas, we obviously would like to also be able to produce the additive. So what I'm going to talk about today is some uh, some studies were done into the possibility of generating ethers, in particular MTBE, from synthesis gas reactions. And I should mention that there are extremely few reports into, in dealing with the production of ethers to syngas. And in reality, the only ones I'm aware of, other than what I'm going to talk about today, is the work in terms of generating dimethyl ether, uh, basically from methanol. Now, how can we make MTBE from synthesis gas? Well, we, we ideally would like to make it directly from synthesis gas, but what we were interested in doing initially was just to decide whether MTBE could be formed in a CO hydrogenation reaction. And there are two ways we can try to force MTBE to be formed. One is to say, well, let's, uh, let's take a, uh, a methanol synthesis catalyst and generate methanol. And during the generation of methanol, let's add isobutylene to the reaction and see if the isobutylene can intercept the methanol intermediate before the methanol is formed and form MTBE directly. The second approach is to say, well, let's start out with a bifunctional catalyst, which contains both methanol synthesis sites as well as etherification sites, acid sites, so that the methanol synthesis site, site one, generates methanol, and then the methanol reacts with isobutylene to form MTBE. Very simple concept, uh, but there are a number of difficulties in doing this. And I'll list some of them here, uh, and how we went about resolving them. Uh, the first difficulty is the fact that MTBE formation, the etherification reaction, in other words, the reaction of methanol with isobutylene to form MTBE, it's equilibrium limited at high temperatures. And by high temperatures, I really mean anything above 175 or 200. You're just not going to get a whole lot of MTBE because the equilibrium lies towards methanol and isobutylene. So this means that we cannot just simply take a conventional methanol synthesis catalyst, such as a you know, copper zinc oxide or something along those lines, uh, because I, these tend to operate at high temperatures, 
250 and above. So we really have to restrict ourselves to the use of uh, noble metal catalysts, uh, such as palladium or rhodium, which also are methanol synthesis catalysts, but they tend to operate uh, reasonably well at a lower temperature. The second problem we run into is that if we look at the uh, source of acid sites that's used commercially, amberlis 15, the sulfonic acid resin, well, you can't use it under these conditions because it begins to fall apart at about 100 degrees centigrade. In falling apart, it releases sulfonic acid groups. If you have sulfur and you got a metal, nothing is going to work. So amberlis 15 catalysts cannot be used for this type of synthesis. However, there's a possibility of using some other solid acids, such as zeolites. And the third problem we run into is that we, we have a CO hydrogenation uh, scheme going on, and we're trying to add an olefin to it. Well, any catalyst that is capable of hydrogenating carbon monoxide, it's also a good olefin hydrogenator. So you have competing reactions of trying to react isobutylene with methanol, while at the same time, the catalyst is trying to hydrogenate your olefin. So we, we dealt with that by including alkali promoters in our uh, metal catalyst to try to reduce its hydrogenation ability. So the two questions uh, I'd like to pose and try to answer here today is, first of all, can MTB be synthesized simply on metal site? Is it possible to just take some sort of metallic site and make MTB? And secondly, can MTB be synthesized over a bifunctional catalyst? The bifunctional catalyst will then contain methanol synthesis sites and acid sites. Let's talk a little bit about the experimental uh, work that we did. Uh, we prepared our, our own catalyst. We, we decided to work with a palladium silica catalyst. Uh, we also did some work with rhodium silica and rhodium aluminum, and I'll summarize that work very quickly at the end. And in order to reduce the hydrogenation ability of the palladium, we promoted it with various levels of lithium. Uh, in order to try to have as consistent a catalyst as possible, what we did is we prepared a base catalyst with a nominal 5% palladium and silica, and characterized this material, and then added lithium at different levels by sequential impregnations. Yeah, this is a, if you look at our lithium to palladium ratio, these are significant levels of lithium relative to the palladium. So this was our methanol synthesis catalyst. Our acid catalyst, we, we picked two uh, zeolites. Uh, one is an HCSN5 uh, from Mobile, and of course we picked HCSN5 because HCSN5 seems to be the magic catalyst that can do everything, and HY. Uh, the silica to aluminum ratio of about 12 and 6, respectively, that corresponds to 8 times 10 to the 20th per gram Bronsted sites for the ZSM5 and 13 times 10 to the 20th per gram Bronsted sites for the HY. Uh, these sites were actually measured directly, so we know that they are, uh, that the, these are reasonable estimates as to the number of Bronsted sites. I should also add that neither one of these catalysts had any extra lattice aluminum that may have contributed to the present, that may have brought in the presence of Lewis site. So they're fairly clean zeolite casts. The CO hydrogenation studies were carried out uh, using about a gram of catalyst, temperature range of about 175 to 200, slightly elevated pressure, 7 bar, and hydrogen to CO ratio of 1. Now, the, the way the reaction studies were carried out is the CO hydrogenation was started. The reaction was allowed to achieve steady state. This typically took between 10 to 20 hours. And we're operating in a differential, under differential conditions, meaning that our total CO conversion was typically 2% or below. Uh, so we, we're, we're really dealing with very low conversions here. After the reaction had reached steady state, then we started, we added isobutylene. The isobutylene was added from a 10% uh, isobutylene with helium at a total throw rate of uh, 4 cc's per minute versus 15 for the hydrogen and the CO. And this 
Um, isobutylene addition was allowed to continue for about eight to 10 hours until either the reaction reached steady state or the catalyst completely deactivated, or we were satisfied that we were seeing nothing, one of the three conditions. And then we switched back, we turned off the isobutylene, went back to the CO hydrogenation. Now, the way we did this, there is a little bit of partial pressure change in our syngas mixture where we add the isobutylene, but it's small enough that the effects we're going to see are really not due to the changes in partial pressure. Now, the three experimental arrangements that we looked at, uh, the first was to answer the question of whether we can intercept the methanol intermediate as it is being formed by isobutylene. And in this case, we just simply use a palladium catalyst. This, the second and third approach involved the uh, combination of a palladium catalyst with a zeolite. And we examined it in two different ways. In one case, we looked at a dual bed, where a, the palladium catalyst was the first catalyst that the reaction mixture saw. And it was downstream, it was followed by a zeolite bed. So it was two beds, one on top of the other. And the third approach we took was we just simply mixed a physical mixture of the palladium catalyst with the zeolite catalyst, just sort of mixed them up and poured them in the, uh, into our fixed bed reactor. Uh, the relative, we looked a little bit at the effect of relative amounts of the palladium catalyst and the zeolite. The results I'm going to show all involve a 10 to 1 mixture of palladium catalyst to zeolite. Uh, if you calculate the number of sites, this roughly corresponds to about a one-to-one -one ratio of methanol synthesis sites to Bronsted sites. Somewhere around one, let's say between 0.5 and 2, because it's sort of very hard to, to determine these numbers exactly. But it's roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of the two. Okay, let me summarize what we see well, on the palladium silica catalyst and lithium palladium catalyst. Uh, a little bit about the nomenclature we're using here, palladium on silica one, palladium on silica two. These refers to two different preparations. Okay. And then uh, this one had a four to one lithium to palladium ratio, six to one lithium to palladium ratio, and in the second preparation, we examine one to one, four to one, and obviously we're not going to talk about all of them, but just to sort of give you an idea of this. Uh, these were prepared. This is the analytical results that we got of the finished catalyst. So uh, again, they're they're fairly similar to different batches. Uh, if we look at the CO uptake, uh, a couple of things happen. Uh, you notice that addition of lithium to our palladium catalyst doesn't seem to affect the CO uptake. So again, this, this would sort of suggest also, like the last speaker explained, that the alkali is not just si simply sitting on top of the palladium and blocking it. Uh, and now we're dealing with a fairly, a, a significantly larger molecule than hydrogen, so I'm not sure about the being able to diffuse it between the two, but, but in fact we see that the apparent dispersion doesn't change. Uh, we can calculate a dispersion, it's roughly about 20%, 20 to 30% depending on what you look at. Uh, so that's one effect of the lithium addition is that it does not seem to affect the number of available sites on the surface. What it does seem to affect, if we look, let's just look at one of these series, is it does seem to affect the rate of CO hydrogenation significantly. So in fact, as we add lithium to our palladium silica, uh, you can see that actually it's, it's pretty interesting to look at this one because addition of a small amount of lithium increases the uh, CO hydrogenation rate, or the CO consumption rate, and then further addition reduces it. Now, if you look at the selectivities, the selectivities are really predominant in methanol. So, so we have a very selective methanol catalyst in all cases. 
Now, what we're really interested in, the reason why we added the lithium is because we want to cut back the hydrogenation. And we see, at least uh, qualitatively here, that, well, semi-qualitatively, that the hydrogenation ability seems to be decreased. Certainly the CO uh, hydrogenation, the CO rate, has been decreased. So this sort of tends to indicate that the hydrogenation activity has been This is probably a more interesting reaction because here is a comparison on, on the first series of catalysts as to, the, these are the same, well, this is now the rate of methanol production of these, okay? Uh, you see the rate of methanol production drops. But what's interesting is what happens when we add the isobutylene. Uh, the rate of methanol production decreases slightly, 10, 20%, something like that. There's, it's a definite decrease. As soon as we add the isobutylene, we see a decrease in the rate, and it stays fairly constant. I'll show you some down the screen data in a little bit. Uh, and this is perhaps due to the fact that the isobutylene is either uh, consuming some of the hydrogen, or it's perhaps occupying site, so your overall methanol rate drops a little bit. Okay, not unusual. What's interesting to see is our isobutylene conversion, okay? And our isobutylene conversion for our palladium silica is 100%, okay? It's all consumed, and it basically all goes to, uh, to butane, isobutane. Okay, that's the main product. You're just hydrogenating the isobutylene. The isobutylene doesn't have a chance to intercept the methanol intermediate. However, by addition of lithium, we can bring down the isobutylene conversion significantly. Okay, so in, in fact, we are hindering the hydrogenation ability of this catalyst towards the olefins while still retaining a pretty nice rate of methanol production. So if we're going to be able to see MTBE directly from the reaction of isobutylene with the methanol intermediate, we ought to see it in one of these uh, catalysts. And the fact is, we don't see it. We, we see no trace of MTBE when we just simply use a metal catalyst. And uh, I think we can safely say, we, we've done this with palladium, several types of palladium. We've done it with rhodium. Uh, we have never seen MTBE products from just a simple addition of isobutylene. The main reaction is just hydrogenation. So what can we say then about these attempts and an MTBE formation? Well, we see a slight decrease in methanol formation, uh, maybe due to blockage of methanol synthesis site by the isobutylene or competition for absorbed hydrogen. The main reaction is hydrogenation. Lithium certainly inhibits the hydrogenation activity of palladium. And last, no direct reaction of isobutylene with the intermediate. And our main conclusion at this point is that these metal sites are really not active in etherification. So can a composite catalyst do it? Well, the first thing I want to show you is some uh, results from the dual bed experiments. Okay, we have a, a bed of palladium catalyst followed by a bed of uh, zeolite, 10 to 1. And what I'm showing, the first, the top graph here is simply the, the lithium palladium silica catalyst. Okay, this is 6 to 1 lithium to palladium ratio. And here is the, uh, roughly the average activity after we reach steady state. And you see that the, the, the closed circles is when we add isobutylene. The open circles is in the absence of isobutylene. You see that addition of isobutylene, like I explained, reduces the activity but it stays fairly constant. Now the same reaction over a lithium palladium bed followed by an HY bed. And the first thing you notice is that the rate of methanol production, and let me not say the rate of methanol production, let me now say the rate of methanol pollution <coughs> from the fixed bed, because we don't know how much methanol is produced. We can only analyze at the end of the, of the reactor. So the rate of methanol elution is now a factor of six lower than it was 
just for the plain palladium silicate catalyst. Okay. Now, obviously what's happening here is we're making methanol and then we're passing methanol over a zeolite and we're probably destroying the methanol. So it just never makes it out. When we turn on the isobutylene, we begin to see an increase in the amount of methanol eluding from the reactor. Now, what's interesting is to look at what happens to MTBE. Obviously, there is no MTBE prior to isobutylene addition. But as soon as we add the isobutylene, we see a measurable amount of MTBE form. And all, this is one of many, many products that we observed. And as time goes on, the MTBE decreases until it finally basically goes to zero. Uh, and you see that as this decreases, our methanol is increasing, and we suspect that what's happening here is that the MTBE is just simply coking up on DHY, it's deactivating DHY, so therefore the HY can no longer consume the methanol, and we begin to see the methanol, the rate of methanol elution climb. Okay, but we are in fact making these, the MTBE at this point. Okay, same story with ZSO5. This is our same catalyst. This is the same figure you saw before. Now we're using ZSM5. And in fact, when we use ZSM5, our rate of methanol production is also lower to begin with. We add isobutylene. It drops a little bit more. Uh, when we look at the MTBE, this is actually on a different scale than the one before. Okay. This is our rate of 0 to 1 here. We're making we're having rate of uh, an MTB elution of about 0.5 or less. This is actually about an order of magnitude higher. And it drops and then just sort of continues. And uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to see here, but it just sort of reaches steady state. It just sort of sat there. We we're continuously making MTB. The MTB elution never did go down to zero. Also, the activity for methanol did not increase here, which uh, we found puzzling, but it may be that we just CSM5 just doesn't coke up as easily. So, so you still have this destruction of the methanol taking place in the CSM5 zeolites, and you just never coke the site so that the methanol production can take over again. Now, let me say a little bit about the products we see. Uh, these are basically the these are again rates rates of elution or formation. This is for the plain palladium catalyst. And this is what we see in the absence of isobutylene and with isobutylene. And what I'd like to point out is that even in the absence of isobutylene, we see, uh, this is in CSM5, we see very large number of products. Uh, you can see particularly the methane is very interesting to look at because our methanol has dropped by about a factor of 10. But our methane has increased. So, in fact, it's pretty obvious that we're making methane from the methanol. The methanol that's forming on the palladium catalyst is being reacted on the zeolite. Addition of uh, isobutylene gives us a bunch of products. The main ones, of course, are not MTB. MTB is actually very small amounts. Our main products are still our hydrogenation products. Here is my uh, C4 uh, uh, paraffins, and we make a very large amount of the C8 dimer. Okay, so in other words, the, the, what, what the zeolite is doing is it's really just dimerizing the isobutylene. That seems to be the easiest reaction to take place here. Okay, so what can we say about dual beds? Okay, well, the MTB, in fact, can be synthesized when acid sites are provided. However, the rate of both methanol and MTB synthesis, especially MTB synthesis, is very, very low. We've got a complex product slate, and we do have, we, we do see a very quick deactivation of the catalyst. And finally, I do want to, again, emphasize that CSM5 appears to have a higher resistance to deactivation. Well, if a dual bed works, is it possible to just mix the two things and get it to work? That would certainly be the way to go. And 
again, let me let me show you the, the, the summary here. Uh, this is again the same cattle as we saw before, same same plot. And now what I want to show you is only with HY. Okay. But now this is a, a physical mixture. The, the, the zeolite sites, the acid sites, are distributed evenly, or as close as evenly as we can throughout the bed. And what we see now is that we don't see that increase in the methanol rate of production, maybe a slight increase, but not much. And we see pretty much the same, the same story we saw before. We see some MTBE. But in the HY, it begins to decrease and eventually goes to zero. So I guess in summary here, the comparison with the if a dual bed with a physical mixture is that they, they both behave very similarly. Okay? There's no need to worry about having a dual bed, with the only concern being that if you have a physical mixture, a lot of the zeolite sites, a lot of the acid sites, would probably be underutilized on the top of the bed because you don't have enough methanol concentration. Now let me say something about the about the effect of the uh, of the lithium content. And what I have here is this is the lithium on ZSO5, and it's a slightly different temperature. But what I want to show you here is a comparison of a physical mixture of the lithium palladium with ZSO5, a lithium palladium of 1, a lithium palladium of 4. And what I'd like to point out here is that when the lithium palladium ratio is 1, our MTB production rate is really very, very small, 0.1. And the main product we see are the isobutane normal butane and some of the C8 uh, products, okay? But our main products are hydrogenation, and we're essentially consuming, completely consuming, our isobutylene. When we go to a lithium to palladium ratio of four, you notice we do not consume our isobutylene. In fact, again, we, we, we've cut down our hydrogenation ability. And our number of saturated C4s is not quite as great because the isobutylene is not being hydrogenated. It now has a chance to react to form the dimer. And it also has a chance to react to form MTBE. So we actually can increase our MTBE <coughs> production rate by about a factor of 10. Still very low, but it is increased. It is a function of the hydrogenation ability of the methanol synthesis sites. Okay, well, let me quickly sort of show this to sort of summarize what's happening all together. We have CO and hydrogen that react in a palladium site to form methanol. This methanol can then either react with isobutylene on a zeolite site to form MTBE, or it can react in a zeolite site to form dimethyl ether, hydrocarbons, and perhaps coke. Similarly, the isobutylene can either go to MTB or to all these products. And I guess the real challenge in making a, a, uh, a useful <coughs> process or a useful catalyst to do this is to try to maximize this route rather than these routes down here. So in summary, let me just say that the lithium palladium silica catalyst uh, can provide Methanol synthesis sites with reduced olefin hydrogenation ability so that an olefin can be added without it just simply being consumed into the paraffin. Uh, the MTB formation cannot be carried out solely by methanol produce, producing metal sites. It has to be a bifunctional catalyst or a mixture of two catalysts to do that. And when that's when acid sites are present, then MTB can be synthesized. And we find that zeolites such as HY and ZSO5 work for this reaction. And the major byproducts included isobutane, obviously from hydrogenation, C8 dimers, and the cracked products of the dimer. And the more important, most important slide, I'd like to <laughs> acknowledge the support of the Department of Energy through the Pittsburgh Energy Technology Center for this uh, work. And thank you.
thoughts on combining the uh, doing something with the catalyst that make methanol and isobutanol simultaneously? That would be wonderful. Uh, the main problem with that, I think it's some of the work that Clear has done, is that when you when you take the two alcohols and you try to couple them to make MTB, rather than making MTB, you make MIB, which is an octane reducer. So Murphy's Law gets you again. I think that's a general yeah. I, I think you really, I, well, I think just that if you have, because the problem is you're doing a dehydration rather than purification. I think if you're doing a dehydration, the, the principal product is the methyl isobutyl ether rather than the methyl purification. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> well, the simple ideas from the, to understand the competitive CO2 absorption might be carbon monoxide, but just to release that so and uh, kick out of the body. Okay. And uh, so that's, uh, I, I'm not sure as why it's it does uh, body is so easy to hydrogenate to alkane in to, under the carbon monoxide. Yes, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, it, it would seem like yeah, most yeah, of the surface yes. would, it would seem like most of the surface would be covered by CO, and there'd be very little hydrogen. But apparently, there is enough hydrogen to hydrogenate all the olefin. I'd rather see you. Okay, let's thank Thank you.